And let's bring in Greg Sheridan, foreign editor at The Australian. Greg, what have you made of the visit so far? Well, Kieran, uh, it's been a weird visit, really. It's, it's kind of had an element of, um, you know, panda diplomacy. There's been no substance to it. Uh, I thought the Prime Minister really made a complete mess of the Chung Lei stuff and then was forced to speak about it today. How much better if he'd just spoken about it yesterday um, and he didn't seem, need to say much more than he said today? But uh, he had to be pushed into it by the opposition and by commentators and so on. He seems to be terrified of upsetting the Chinese. Um, I think the China relationship is a real conundrum from Australia because we get rich out of the trade, there's no doubt about that. But they are a really malevolent strategic actor uh, acting against our strategic interests in every theatre, the South Pacific, cybercrime, foreign interference, the whole lot. And the instinct of a government to try to have a politically closer relationship with our big trade partner contradicts our strategic interests. And once again, we've described China as a comprehensive strategic partner. Meantime, you're, you're, you know, the officials are advised to use burner phones when they go into a room with Chinese officials because they'll, they'll steal their data off their uh, regular phones. So I think the visit just presents the contradiction that China is for Australian policy. And that contradiction, is that just the reality that we have to live with? It is, but I don't think our government is doing a particularly good job in explaining the contradiction. So we don't want China in our critical uh, minerals industry. And that, it's better if we just say that straight up. And when they behave very badly towards our citizens, as they did with Chiang Lai, and they're still holding that writer in, in shocking conditions uh, as just part of their yeah. hostage diplomacy, well, we should be very upfront yeah. in defending our own interests. And, of course, we want to trade with them, but we ought to have as a national objective diversifying trade away from China. And yet Don Farrell, the trade minister, says, let's make $300 billion into $400 billion. But every time we get a chance to diversify to another nation like India, we seem to make a mess of it. And, of course, as I've often said to you, Kieran, we're doing nothing in our own interests in defence policy. And... Uh, so an Australian government is either forced to condemn China when it attacks our troops on the high seas or it's sucking up to China in a way that suggests there are no problems whatsoever. Uh, I, I think the Prime Minister gets his tone consistently wrong. He seems to have stage fright and to be scared of saying anything in the presence of a Chinese leader which could be regarded as less than effusive praise. But then the Chinese leader goes home and the defence minister has got to say, well, we need nuclear submarines to protect us against China. And um, you can't have those two messages unreconciled. Yeah, indeed. And, and on the Chung Lei matter, the opposition confirmation via Andrew Clonell that they did raise it with the Premier yesterday. Simon Birmingham will be with me to discuss that in about... 15, 20 minutes from now, but they did take it to him directly. Yeah, so uh, I thought Morrison and Dutton overdid the anti-China rhetoric in government. They were always talking about war, whereas we had no weapons. So Labor's critique of them is fair enough. And on a lot of substance, Labor has done quite well, persisting with AUKUS and, uh, you know, contesting Chinese um, strategic presence in the South Pacific. But now I would say the Dutton opposition gets its tone very, very, uh, very well. Both Simon Birmingham and Andrew Hastie in their different ways get the tone on China very well. So the Chiang Lai matter, I mean, I'm a great admirer of Chiang Lai's, but this wasn't a fundamental grievous abuse of her human rights, but it was completely unacceptable in the Australian parliament. So a, a sensible leader has to just say... The Chinese embassy officials overstepped the mark here and that kind of conduct is unacceptable in Australia. Then if the Chinese overreact, that's up to them. But Albanese seems terrified yeah. even of saying that initial remark, whereas I think all the opposition statements on this have been perfectly, um, perfectly sensible. I think that David Littleproud calling on the Chinese Premier to apologise, that's a bit silly, that's over the top. But generally speaking, I think the Dutton opposition gets its tone right on China, whereas I don't think yeah. the Morrison government did.
The, the war cabinet uh, has been dissolved by Benjamin Netanyahu and uh, as our viewers would have seen a few minutes ago, some pretty major protests outside his home now. Yeah, I think dissolving the war cabinet really weakens Netanyahu's position. Um, Netanyahu has got to bear responsibility for the unpreparedness of Israel for the October 7 attack. And uh, he is now a liability to Israel in terms of its international standing. And his government is dependent on two horrible uh, thugs. Um, it's not a thuggish government overall, but it's dependent on the, on the votes of two horrible uh, two horrible thugs. And when he had the the National Unity Cabinet, the War Cabinet, you could say that this was a government for the whole of Israel. It would be much better now if Israel had elections and sorted out a new government. The problem is yeah. that Israel takes months and months and months to have an election. So uh, Israel needs Netanyahu to move on but there's no mechanism because he still has the numbers in the Knesset, provided he's willing to depend on these extremist ministers. You're speaking of elections, a bit of a boost in the polling for Nigel Farage right now, although Labor will win the upcoming election, Greg. Absolutely. So Nigel Farage is not really running against Labor, he's running against the Conservatives, and he is a deadly threat to the Conservatives, a deadly, deadly threat. He could, get, he could get 4 million votes and still only end up with a handful of seats, but he could wipe the Tories out. He could change their representation from, from, 100 to 60, uh, from 200 to 60. He could be the difference there because he will steal... 90% of his votes will come from people who would otherwise vote Conservative. Now, we could... I'm not forecasting this, but we could conceivably be witnessing one of those historic shifts where the alignment of the major parties changes. If Farage only gets a couple of seats and the Tories still win the majority of non-Labor seats, they might survive. But after the election, if he's won as many votes as they've won, uh, you could see moves to merge. If he's got into Parliament himself, you could see him become a Conservative and take over the leadership. I mean, Farage is a, a, a very mixed grill. He's a bit of a rough diamond. But I would say with Boris Johnson... He is one of the two most consequential, historically consequential conservatives of the last 20 years. And, um, at the, you know, there are polls which put reform now ahead of the Conservative Party, which is a staggering wow. position for, for it to be. And um, so this is really a dynamic and unpredictable election. Now, you're absolutely right, Kieran, Labor's going to win. But the Conservative versus reform contest is, is the real contest now, I think. It certainly looks it, doesn't it? And uh, momentum is only on one side of that contest. Greg, thank you. Appreciate it.